start the presentation. And we should be all set to go. So again, thanks for coming. Um, as uh, Patrika said, I'm a Jerome Pesquero. I'm the lead product manager at uh, Sum. I'm in charge of what we call the platform and of uh, new products. But today um, I'm here mostly to talk about data and more specifically about data challenges in retail. So uh, on the agenda, quite simple. Uh, I'm gonna start by talking a little bit, a little bit about the uh, global trends uh, about AI and retail, just to set the stage uh, properly. Uh, then I'll dig into uh, you know, the importance of data uh, for AI, but also for AI in retail in, um, in general. And I'll move on after that to uh, the core of this talk, uh, talk, which is about providing some very telling and illustrative examples of some of the challenges that we face uh, at uh, Sama and that our clients uh, face with uh, data annotation or training data. And I'll end by giving a quick introduction to uh, what we do at Sama and how we can help. So global trends, again, just to set the stage over here. Um, it's not gonna be any surprise to anyone uh, on the, attending this webinar, but AI is here and it's here to stay. And it's uh, also gonna be um, taking more and more room at an accelerated rate over the next few years. Uh, by certain estimates, uh, we, uh, we predict a 30% uh, compound uh, annual growth rate uh, for the next five or six years. Now, why is that? And why is AI so important in retail? There's a number of reasons, but uh, I've listed here the uh, three most important ones. Uh, the first one, and the one we'll be probably focusing the most uh, on uh, over the, um, over for this uh, for the remaining of this talk is because AI is really a gateway to providing better customer experience. It allows for a personalized recommendations to your customers, something that not only uh, they crave, but they they really expect uh, the, these days and uh, you know will turn to your competitors if you don't uh, provide it properly. AI also helps a lot with um, your processes and being more efficient for things such as uh, inventory management. Are, or for your driving automation processes that uh, increase margins. And finally, and I think this is something that is um, just as important as the other two, is um, there's no way that we know of today to go through uh, all the data that uh, we collect in retail other than through AI uh, means. Um, there's so much data that um, the only way to draw uh, great insights from it is through our artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, techniques. So um, it's all about the data, but before uh, we get into this, I just want to have kind of a little bit of a refresher. What we're going to be talking about today is not any type of data and for any type of machine learning. And by the way, my slides might say machine learning or artificial intelligence. They're not exactly the same thing. One is a subset of the other, but uh, for, uh, for the purpose of this talk, uh, I might be using them inter interchangeably. So we're going to be focused on supervised learning, where you know you still need to have labeled or annotated uh, data uh, to train your models, uh, and because that's how your models uh, learn what to do, uh, what to predict uh, once they're in production. It's a big part of machine learning. It's not the only part, but it's also, in my opinion, the most interesting part uh, these days. As a refresher, what are we talking about here? So what do we mean by training a model here? You have a model that you want to put in production, but before you need to train it, to do that, you need to give it what we call training data, which is a combination of assets, which might be images, which are or videos, or even 3D point clouds, and annotations, which is essentially what you would expect your model, once it's in production, to be, to be predicting uh, uh, when given the, the assets. So in this case, you know that would be uh, an example of training data, an image uh, with this lady uh, wearing uh, different pieces of clothing and the categories have already been assigned to the different pieces of clothing she, she's wearing. And even uh, in some cases, you might have uh, a polygon that defines a contour of uh, the hat in this case. Now to train the model, what is needed is um, these assets and annotations uh, you know, uh, in different uh, formats and, and shapes uh, millions uh, or hundreds of thousands or millions of times. And that's how your model learned. The point of this slide here is to show the importance of, of data very early on in the model uh, development life cycle. 
So basically garbage in, garbage out, and that's why you need really good training data to get good results. Um, here is the next phase. Once you have uh, your model that's trained, you still need to be able to test it. And uh, in order to test it, what we typically do is we put together a test data set and with what we call ground truth annotations. And then we can compare the predictions that come from the model with the ground truth annotations to um, assign a, an accuracy metric to uh, your model. And again, here data is key and training data is key because if your test data set is not representative of the data that you would be expecting in production, or if your ground truth annotations, which is kind of the answers to the questions over here are not properly done, then you're just not assessing your model properly. You're not assessing it for the right reason. Finally, once you're ready, you can put it in production. Um, Whoops, so here I covered this part already. You can put it, you can put your model in production. And um, here again, data is really at the core of everything. Uh, one typical problem that we uh, often see is uh, data drift, is that even if your model is performing uh, as expected, your data might change at some point. Uh, think of if you're, uh, for instance, in retail, then the, you might be introducing new products uh, to your product line. And those are uh, images of products that your model has never seen in the training phase, so it won't be able to recognize them. So I like to say that your model is never as good as, it, as the first day that you put in, uh, in production. And then after that, it will slowly degrade uh, in, in performance, mostly because uh, your data is changing ever so slightly uh, every day. Another way to take a look at the importance of uh, data is just to uh, consider how much time the ML engineers or the, the data scientists uh, spend on just any data related tasks. And by certain accounts, it's up to 80% 80, 80 of the time that is just spent on the data itself, either cleaning it, labeling it, uh, augmenting it, et cetera, et cetera. The point of these uh, previous slides uh, and the takeaway message basically is it's all about the data. And if you've noticed, um, I barely talked about the model, what it does, uh, its architecture, et cetera, et cetera. It's not to say that it's not important. It's just that models are becoming more and more um, you know, off the shelf and your competitive edge is gonna reside in how you treat your data and what kind of data you use to, uh, uh, and how you, 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 you use it to train your, your models. Okay, data annotation challenges. So this is what I suggest for the next few slides. Um, well, first I'm gonna go through you know, a very simple AI model life cycle. And then uh, from the data point of view again, and then we'll go through examples, very uh, illustrative examples at each of these phases. But before, um, I think it's a good idea to just uh, go through a refresh over here. Typically what you wanna wanna do as a retailer is uh, collect some data. Uh, then after that, you might have, uh, you might acquire that data, you might collect, collect it, you might generate it. Um, but um, what typically happens is that you end up with a lot of data and you need to prepare it for annotation. Now, most of the time you have a limited budget or a fixed budget, uh, you might not be able to send all of that data for annotation. So there is a phase around data preparation, which has to do also with like picking the data with the most value that you want annotated. Then there's this phase of the annotation that is the core of our business at Sama, though we do offer uh, products and services and all the other ones as well. Once your data is annotated, you it's you have your the output of this is your training data. You uh, you can start uh, using it to uh, train your models. The first time you train your models, a few couples of times, they won't be uh, perfect, and that's why there's another phase after that where you might need to add more data. You may not, might need to correct some of your annotations. You might need to uh, uh, you, to change a little bit the uh, the the just the annotation strategy that you have, um, just to tune your model in some of these classes or some of these use cases where it's not performing very uh, well uh, uh, yet. And then once you're ready, you can put it in production and you're not done as we saw with the data drift, you still need to monitor and baby your model uh, because it will degrade with time, mostly because your data is changing. 
Okay, so um, here are some of the questions that we get from our uh, clients. And along the questions, I'll just uh, come up with some of the recommendations uh, we have for dealing with these uh, issues and challenges. The first one is in the data collection phase, and it has to do with the data. This one is not specific to uh, AI only or even to, or to retail, but I just still thought it was a good idea to uh, cover it. So how do I collect and store my training data? We know it. Uh, data can come from different sources. It can be extremely noisy. It can be messy. Sometimes you don't have the right data. Um, uh, and sometimes it's not ready to, to, for you. Sometimes, sometimes that's PII information. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what I've typically seen uh, over the last few years is often uh, executive level um, coming with a uh, mission uh, to extract value from the data that has been collected uh, over the last few years. The, you know, there's usually typically been a big investment in collecting and storing all that data. And now uh, the executive level wants to see a return on investment. What we recommend at SAMA is uh, go the other way around. Because uh, otherwise, you're going to be uh, find the, the whole process over, overwhelming, and you might not be addressing uh, the right business uh, you needs. So, what we recommend is to identify your business objectives right from the get go, and then to work your way back to the data requirements. Now, some of the data uh, you might not have, some of it you might have, but at least now you have a clear path to uh, business success, uh, as opposed to the other way around. How much data do I need, and when do I need it? Um, in this case, like in, in, in a lot of the cases in machine learning and retail, we are faced with a long tail problem. So uh, in this case, uh, you know, if you're talking about uh, trying to improve uh, relevancy of a, your search engine, for instance, uh, in a retailer, you might have tens of thousands, hundreds, hundreds of thousands, or even millions of uh, products that you have. Um, and, but only about 20% of those products account for over 80% of the searches. Uh, in the frequency of the year. So where, where do you start? Uh, our recommendation is to start by focusing on a subset of the data and probably uh, the one that's in the head over here and to work your way through the long tail, but you know, in a methodical way, uh, slice by slice, but get your results quickly uh, with uh, what really matters the most uh, at first. So I do have an example about this. We work uh, with Walmart. We've been work working with Walmart for quite, quite a while, uh, 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 other great partners. Um, what they are trying to do constantly is to try to improve their search relevancy and always looking for a better way to provide um, uh, and improve the customer experience. Um, so in this case, what we do is do we do look at um, some of the images that are associated to their product lines and some of the categorization and the descriptions of, of those products, we validate that everything is okay. And we even improve uh, by providing suggestions uh, just to improve the entire experience. Now we didn't start by doing this with, uh, you know, there are millions of products. We started with like a few uh, products in a few categories. And with time, we've been adding uh, more categories. I think now in the tens of thousands of categories or even more than that, where we started only with a couple thousand. And the results uh, are very tangible. Uh, that has increased our algorithm accuracy by 30% and, uh, and growing. Uh, and most importantly, it's uh, allowed them to offer a way better uh, customer experience, uh, which in turn uh, results in increased conversion rates. Okay, another question uh, during data collection. This is actually a question that uh, we don't get that often, but we should be getting more often. <laughs> and the question is, how do I make sure the data sent for annotation is representative of data my model will observe in production? Um, the reason why I say it's not asked too often is because this is assumed to be the case, but um, it's very much, um, it, it, it happens quite often that the data that is used to train the model that is used by the machine learning engineers and, and, and the team and developers is completely different than what that model will see uh, once it's in production. And uh, that just means that your model, model in production won't get, won't get the same level of performance than what you see uh, during the training phases. What we recommend is fairly simple. We just uh, recommend not to assume that your training data is going to look like your data in production. And that is like to not make this assumption anywhere in the value chain. So if you're in the machine learning engineer, constantly 
uh, go uh, talk to your business, uh, business units, go talk to the domain experts and ask to see what that uh, data and production is like. And the other way around is true as well. Constantly verify with your ML engineer teams that uh, the data that you're using for the uh, training is really similar to what uh, you see in uh, production. This is one of my favorite co uh, topics. How do I make sure there's no inherent bias in my data? Unfortunately, because this is only an hour session, um, I can't do it uh, justice, but I still thought that it was a good idea to have a slide on this uh, with a few uh, maybe recommendations. Uh, the point of this slide is just to show that there are tons of types of uh, biases and they all can have a negative, uh, negative consequences, of course. It's also to uh, remind everyone that this is a very serious topic that has, can have dramatic consequences uh, and that we don't want, uh, we, we wanna be very aware of uh, uh, how we, we constantly look at um, the, the possible effects that, that this can have. So I didn't wanna, Come up with examples that are uh, the ones that result in you know complete nightmares and PRs because they're completely unexcusable. Instead, I, I want to show you that this can be very subtle as well. So, for instance, uh, in this case, imagine that uh, you're a retailer who would like to be able to send a virtual uh, customized magazine to uh, some of your customers because you have your email address. And uh, this is based on the, their last purchases. So in this example, you might have bought, for instance, some barbecue tools. And um, the algorithm puts together a virtual magazine and sends it to you. Now, the only problem, and that virtual magazines might, might, might be um, uh, holding some you know, barbecue images, some recipes, et cetera. The only problem with this is that you're a woman like you're the one who bought the tools for yourself. And it might be a little bit uh, jarring and a little bit disconcerting from a you know, user experience point of view to see that um, there are, uh, the, the, the virtual magazine basically is, uh, is continuing some, <laughs> some stereotypes here. Um, so again, not a very dramatic example. When, when, enough, uh, when, when it is telling enough to show that bias can be at uh, every level uh, uh, of a machine learning uh, journey. So a couple of recommendations. Again, uh, the links are in uh, this deck and the idea is uh, to refer to them afterwards. Um, you got to stay up to data or to date on uh, the field of research. You have to be proactive and, and very responsible in constantly looking for um, those areas where you can have small or big bias. And the reason why it's important to be able to look at bias at every level, it's just because it's gonna be across the board. And because if you can catch small biases, you can also uh, catch those like uh, dramatically, uh, completely unexcusable biases uh, 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 on, the big, on the big scale as well. Okay, moving on. Uh, during a phase of data preparation, which parts of my training data should I get annotated first? So this is one of my favorite questions. Like I mentioned before, um, once you've been collected, once you've collected all the data or you've acquired it, uh, you might end up with a huge amount of it and not all of it uh, needs or can be annotated. So which one do you pick? Um, what's shown over here is an example of a children toy uh, retailer. And um, they have images of a number of their overall, their, their toys basically, uh, but they don't know where to start and uh, which of these images should be annotated first. Uh, the dots that you see here in the background, each of them might represent a particular image. So we do have techniques, products and, and algorithms to uh, classify uh, the different types of uh, images, to cluster them, and then to rebalance it so that you can send a really nice balanced uh, data set to be annotated with images that hold the most information for the models to learn from once you're training them. A recommendation is always to prioritize annotation that um, data that is well distributed across your whole pool of data. And that uh, most importantly holds the risk, richest information uh, first so can, your model can get to uh, a, you know, good performance and accuracy as fast as possible. Of course, again, uh, you know, use production data whenever possible. 
In some special cases, uh, that's not going to be enough. Um, so in this particular example, we might have identified a cluster of very similar action, uh, action figures over here. The only issue, and you know, it's true, they're similar, same color, same height, same kind of shape. The uh, only issue over here is that they come from two different comp uh, competitors, competitive uh, com competitors, um, and uh, that's just not going to be acceptable. So they need to be annotated with an extra level of care. How do you deal with these special cases? So there are a number of techniques, one that we really like a, a lot and for which we have tools is called a similarity search, where you can pre-process or process your entire data set and come up with images that are gonna look very similar to these ones over here. And the advantage of that is once you have that subset of similar images, you can annotate, uh, you can focus your annotation efforts on only looking at these uh, uh, is images return images as opposed to uh, your entire data set. Uh, a subset over here might just be a few hundred images, whereas the complete one, which might be ten, tens of thousands or, or, or even hundreds of thousands of images. So it's a way to streamline your process and uh, to get the quality faster. Our recommendation is to pre-process your data so you can perform similarity searches on your pool of data whenever it's relevant. During the data annotation phase, what kind of labels do I need and to what degree of quality? So what's shown on this slide over here on the uh, extreme left slide, uh, side here is um, a polygon annotation of a motorcycle that has, I think, over 100 points. On the other side, we have an annotation that is a lot more coarse that only uses a bounding box to identify where the motorcycle is. And then we have another one in the middle that is kind of in between the two. So which one should I pick when I'm uh, asking for training data? And that's an excellent question. And some of it will depend on the models that you wanna use uh, for, for this particular use case. But often what we see is our customers trying to over-prescribe a little bit with very strict and, and, and high quality data annotation requirements um, uh, too early in the process. You might not need to annotate with this level of accuracy for what you're looking for. And why this is relevant is because the uh, annotation on the left side over here is you know, probably one of two to two orders of magnitude uh, uh, more costly than the one on the right. Is that really worth you know, maybe an extra one or 2% in performance? Those are the questions that our clients need to uh, answer before they start really, really investing too heavily in uh, uh, extremely high quality uh, annotations for, for nothing. Model training and tuning. How do I capture edge cases and deal with complexity? You might have a lot of complexity in uh, use, your use cases. This example that we have over here is one of a smart fridge uh, where there's a camera that is able to identify when items are picked from the fridge. And it's uh, for a use case of a, cashierly, a ca cashierless uh, experience, obviously. Now, not where we're seeing, and we've annotated this one, is that it's fairly easy. Uh, you know, you track the hand, the product is very visible, the model is going to be able to uh, cover these uh, use cases for sure. But now start thinking about, um, you know, edge cases. What happens if the user is wearing a black glove? What if they pick an item and they put it back, but not where it uh, was initially? What if they use their left hand instead of their right hand? What if someone walks by at the same time, what if the lighting changes, et cetera, et cetera. There could be almost an infinite number of uh, edge cases that we could uh, come up with right from the get-go. But that is not what we recommend doing. Uh, our recommendation in those cases is to, rather than trying to predict every edge case during the, uh, the design phase and over-design for your annotation strategy, put in place a plan to uncover these edge cases as they come up, and then, a way to address them quickly, budget and plan accordingly as well. You know, it can be anywhere between 30 and 40 or 50% uh, 
of your budget or your time that is going to be spent on uh, addressing these edge cases uh, or these complex cases one by one. So have this like iterative loop to do it uh, over and over again as they uh, as these uh, edge cases arise. So uh, here I have another uh, example of a project that we worked on um, with uh, Volumental. So what Volumental does is that they offer a kind of a personalized shopping experience. Uh, they produce shoe recommendations that are based on the shape of your shoe. And they used uh, a number of technologies, 3D foot scans, for instance, to um, be able to recognize the 3D shape of uh, your foot. You can think of, for instance, uh, taking your mobile phone uh, and uh, just using it around your foot with the camera or, the, uh, or by taking several pictures and then an algorithm that uh, puts all that information together to get a very accurate uh, 3D shape of your foot. And based on that, Volumental can make recommendations of the type of shoes that you are not only uh, likely to, to, to like, but that will always, uh, that I will also uh, fit you uh, almost perfectly. So you can think of like how complex this is a pro uh, how complex of a problem that can be, how much diversity is needed, and how uh, every edge case needs to be uh, captured properly. There are as many uh, shapes of uh, feet than there are people, um, so it's an extremely long tail in this case. We work with them to uh, provide and annotate this type of data. The results is that, of course, not only does it uh, allows them to provide a very or super personalized uh, recommendations and experience to their, uh, to, to their customers. But it also has the effect that there's less returns on the shoes, uh, which obviously increases uh, margins. This is one of my favorite one, model training and tuning. How do I manage ambiguity? You're, you're, you're definitely gonna see some ambiguity in your, in your data set. So the top left over here, um, can anyone tell me whether this is a red apple or a green apple? Or on the right over here, like should this be categorized as fruit or something else, maybe statue or park display? Our recommendation over here is to try to identify these ambiguous cases as early as possible, often by looking at data. But most importantly, always kind of favor during the annotation phase, a tight feedback mechanism or a process between the domain experts who will tell you what the answer should be over here and the annotators themselves. And then use this as examples that you can also show to the rest of the annotation workforce um, so that they are kind of training as they're also annotating. This is really preferable uh, to, you know, a long, long, long instructions. Clear instructions from the beginning are very important, but uh, you can assume that people won't retain them without the context uh, and, and you're better off um, setting up those uh, really tight feedback loops than, than just, just, you know, uh, providing a hundred uh, page document with every single uh, annotation instruction that no one will retain. How negatively impactful are errors in my data? So what are the consequences of having small or big errors in my data? Um, here, we can think of, for instance, a toy robot that is roaming around uh, your house and has a camera on top. It needs to be able to avoid uh, the objects in the way. So if the algorithm and the robot make a mistake and confused a shoe for a sock and don't get doesn't get the the boundary of of the shoe you know 100% uh, perfect that's not as negatively impactful or, or negative or uh, the effects the consequences are not as negative as if it doesn't identify a child sitting on the ground for instance so not all of your data basically has to be annotated with that same level of quality. A recommendation is try to figure out, you know, what your models absolutely need to get right. And then you work your way back to uh, applying your most strict quality requirements on the data that will, uh, that, that, that pertains to. So devise your annotation and quality rubric with emphasis on the classes and the types of examples 
that your model absolutely need to get right. You're going to be uh, putting your energy and efforts uh, in the right place. Uh, we see this in retail. We see it a lot as well in uh, the autonomous vehicle space where um, it's very important that, for instance, the pedestrian that you are uh, identifying uh, with a certain, uh, with a polygon that, and who is very close to a car be really, uh, you know, the quality on that annotation of the polygon be uh, near perfect. It, it's probably not as important that you get the tree that is 300 yards away with the same level of annotation quality, right? Um, and we've seen clients who try to come up with really, really strict instructions for all their classes, but what ends up happening is that basically you're, you're missing the opportunity to put your efforts where uh, you can have the more, uh, most uh, positive impact. How can I make sure my uh, model in production is still performing as expected? Remember uh, the beginning of the, this webinar, I talked a little bit about data drift. This is a very good example of data drift. So put you in context over here with an example. Uh, imagine you're a brick and mortar re retailer and uh, you've set up a camera or cameras in the parking lot. And uh, with an algorithm, they are tracking how many cars are in the parking lot. And that in turn feeds another algorithm that tries to predict the traffic in your store. So uh, you can manage, uh, you know, allocation, the all allocation assignment of your employees. On the left side, this is a system that's working uh, fairly well. It's not perfect. You can see that, uh, you know, in green over here, it identifies the empty spots and in red, the, the ones that are, are, are taken by a car. And it makes a few mistakes, like this one should be empty probably, and this one as well. But overall, you're getting a fairly good estimate of the number of cars in a parking lot. Now, without you knowing, the company that owns the parking lot has decided that they no longer needed the parking attendant. And that happened a couple of months ago. So people have been starting to park differently. Maybe the lines are not as clear as they were before. So basically your data to your production has changed. All your test data, your model, everything is exactly the same. And you're not picking up the fact that this has changed. But all of a sudden you can see that your estimates of the number of cars in a parking lot is way off. And this, you know, through a chain reaction just means that it's, it's a lot harder to uh, do the assignment or the allocation of your employees in your, in your store. So how do you avoid getting to a situation like that? Because you're really uh, blind when this happens. Well, it has to do with checking with the data again. In this case, what you want to do is constantly check that the current data that you're feeding to your model in production is really similar to the one that you're expecting to see, so the previous data. And you have to be proactive about this. We do have tools to do that. And as soon as you see that there's a little bit of a discrepancy, which indicates that there's data drift, you need to, it needs to trigger uh, uh, basically an alert and a redesign of the training data where you might need to enrich it with more examples of the, current, uh, of, of the current situation, retrain it, put it back in production, and do this uh, you know, from time to time to, sure, to make sure that you manage the data drift. So I think we've covered quite a lot of uh, different uh, challenges. Now, you know, I, I'm at the part of the talk where I, I, I will introduce you to a little bit more of what we do uh, at SAMA and, and, and how we, we tackle uh, those. Um, so, like I said, Sama is really, uh, we, we really specialize in uh, data annotation. Uh, we also do data preparation and our expertise in making sure that we get the right amount of quality at the right price at the output. For that, we have a number of tools. Our, our goal, and I won't go through all these tools uh, separately, but our goal is always to let you focus on uh, what really matters to your business, which is usually uh, our business imperative and business initiatives and business objectives, and let us manage everything that has to do with the data and the workflow of the data uh, 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 and the annotation uh, part of it as well. So what is the SAMA difference? And why uh, do we think we do a better job than others at this? Well, one main point is that uh, we have our own workforce uh, of agents. 
uh, they're specialized and they're trained uh, because they work for SAMA. We have the luxury of like having complete control over their training uh, and over how we can manage quality at every step of the entire process. We do have tools for uh, obviously quality assurance. We use, for instance, sampling, uh, and we can go very uh, uh, granular in how we evaluate and correct for uh, quality. We also offer tools for our clients to do some of their the, the QA sampling themselves if uh, they are interested in contributing to uh, this whole uh, workflow. Of course, we also have automated ways of uh, assessing quality and of correcting some of it that can be uh, corrected programmatically. So it's a combination for us of training processes uh, and, and measurements uh, so that, and, and tools obviously, so, so we can get to the, the best quality to, uh, as, as fast as possible. Um, our business is one where we provide training data uh, to our clients so that they can train their models. We can help them with uh, training those models as well. And, um, but we also, if you want, drink our own champagne um, because we really believe that AI is changing and is gonna continue to change the world. Um, we have our own in-house uh, AI and ML uh, teams who have, the, uh, who have been assigned uh, the, the mandate to come up with um, machine learning algorithms that help during the annotation. Uh, the idea is to increase efficiency, uh, to increase accuracy and quality. We really believe in uh, a human in a loop approach where uh, models, AI models, can really take on the most tedious uh, work from the agents and then the agents can work uh, on the results of, of, of that to focus on the most cognitively loaded uh, parts of the tasks uh, and on the parts that uh, models today are not able to uh, tackle through, uh, through machine learning. Like I said, uh, we have our own workforce of agents that allows us to really control and uh, the, the training and be able to ramp, up, uh, ramp them up to certain levels of efficiency that, that we want, depending on the, on, the, on the case. You might have noticed that during my whole talk, I was talking about um, these closed loop, but quick feedback loop that allows you to identify problems early and tackle them uh, very efficiently and then move on to the next one as they arise those problems. Uh, this is only possible because uh, the entire company works in kind of an agile and iterative way. Uh, all our workflows are developed that way and, uh, and all the way down to you know, agile development, to, uh, obviously. And again, our goal is really to let, uh, let you do what you're good at uh, so, and let us, so, and let us uh, handle uh, the project management part of, uh, of this whole uh, uh, workflow. Security, um, we adhere to all uh, security standards. Uh, we've been doing this uh, for quite a while with uh, big uh, customers. Uh, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this. Uh, we have uh, expertise in, in obviously keeping uh, our client data safe because again, it is the fuel that uh, powers their data. So it is uh, something that holds a competitive edge and a lot of value to them. And, um, I'm going to finish this talk uh, on uh, this slide, and then we can move on to a question. Um, Sama is a cert certified B corporation, and I'm very proud to be working for this company. Uh, I've been talking about data for the past, what, 40, 45 minutes, but I think it's important to realize that behind this data are people. Uh, in our case, people who are mostly in East Africa and who are annotating um, these millions, hundreds of millions of uh, assets, shapes, etc. Uh, and as a company, uh, we have the mission to um, give them work and not aid. We really believe that, that this is the way out of poverty and that it can be a win-win situation. Again, those annotators are uh, employees are ours, which is great because not only um, does it fulfill our mission, but it also allows us to have a lot more uh, 
leverage and levers on how we can manage our workforce uh, and uh, quality overall. We do pay them a living or fair wages. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, I, I, we, we really believe that um, there is a way to, <laughs> to, to not make this uh, a race to the bottom uh, and, and to fulfill our client uh, needs uh, in an ethical, uh, an ethical way. So I think I'm gonna finish on this one last slide that res, uh, summarizes everything, and um, you know, let you uh, ask uh, your questions if you have uh, any. Thanks a lot for your time. Wow, Jerome, this was awesome. And uh, we have a couple questions that have come in. So we'll start with those. And for the audience, please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box uh, so that we can direct them. Uh, so the first question is, uh, I heard you just raised Series B funding. What's next for Sama? So oh yeah, that's, that. <laughs> thanks for asking that, whoever asked that. Um, yeah, it was announced last week, we raised uh, uh, $70 million. Uh, basically it's to continue doing what we uh, we, we do, but maybe uh, also with more of a product uh, approach to everything we do, because that's how we're gonna scale. Again, our objective is to continue growing our workforce in, uh, well, we, we have more than a, one objective, but one of the objectives is to continue to grow our workforce in uh, East Africa and throughout the world. Uh, and at the same time uh, to uh, cater to our client uh, needs. Uh, we want to invest a little bit more obviously into uh, these AI and algorithms to help with the annotation as well and do it at a much bigger scale than we can today uh, because we've been very successful at it so far. That's amazing. Congratulations on that. I know that's no, that's a big deal. Uh, so the next question is, are there any other industries aside from retail that you cover? Yeah, we do. We do cover a, a number of, uh, of other industries. I, I mentioned, for instance, transportation. Uh, retail is still a, an important one for, for us. We have consumer, consumer media as well, uh, robotics and manufacturing, for instance. And I think we are looking at the, where we, no, I think we are looking at the biotech and medical as well. So as you can tell, um, there are some specificities, obviously, about the data itself and how it needs to be uh, labeled. But there are also a lot of overlaps uh, in terms of like the different industries because the expertise is really uh, uh, can be really exportable from one from one vertical to to the next. That's awesome. Audience, any other questions you want to ask before we wrap it up today? This has been this has been incredible. And thank you so much for giving us such detailed examples. I know I've learned a lot and I know this audience is giving you a huge virtual round of applause. <laughs> thank you very much. Right. Yeah, it looks like those are uh, all of our questions for today. Jerome, anything you want to add before we wrap up today? No, it's been a lot of fun to put the, this uh, deck together. Um, I, hopefully, it was uh, helpful in understanding like the type of uh, skill set and challenges uh, that uh, well, you need to have and face, uh, and the challenges that we face uh, uh, on a daily basis. And I look forward to you know hearing from anyone who's interested in learning more about uh, Sama, how we work, or uh, who, who even just has uh, questions. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. This has been incredible. We really appreciate you taking time to share all of this amazing information with us. And for the audience, thank you for your participation today. We hope you've enjoyed this incredible content brought to you by Jerome and Sama. And uh, we'll be around with future events. So please keep an eye on your emails to learn more about what's coming up at AI4 and what's coming up with Sama. Thanks again and have a wonderful day.